I'm really uh, excited uh, to be here today talking about uh, Opportunity Zones. As many of you know, uh, Skybridge has launched uh, an Opportunity Zone uh, REIT. Uh, we're extremely excited about uh, the program. Um, we think uh, you know, it will be very successful from both a, you know, a policy impact perspective, but is also a, a great opportunity um, for investors to, to do good, uh, but make money as well, of course. Uh, so joining me here uh, today, um, we have uh, representatives uh, that are involved in the space in a variety of different ways. Uh, so to my left uh, is Neil Wilson, the, uh, the co-founder and COO of EJF. Uh, EJF is a, uh, a manager that's based in, a hedge fund manager based in uh, Arlington, Virginia that runs approximately 10 billion. Uh, they have a, uh, an EJF uh, Opportunity Zone product uh, in the market as well. Uh, to his left uh, is Reed Thomas, uh, EVP uh, and general manager at NES. Um, NES uh, provides administrative services to, uh, to Opportunity Zone products. Uh, and then uh, to the far left uh, is Alfonso Costa. Uh, so uh, Mr. Costa is the Deputy Chief of Staff to uh, Secretary Ben Carson, who uh, was, uh, was here uh, earlier today uh, and made a bit of news as well with, a, with an announcement that was great for OZs. And, and so uh, Alfonso is going to discuss that uh, a bit. Um, but I'm going to pass it to, uh, to Neil uh, first for a bit of uh, Opportunity Zone uh, 101. Um, and uh, and a, a, a bit more uh, info on EJF, of course, as well. Great. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here at SALT. Uh, we really appreciate the partnership uh, with Skybridge. Uh, it's been a great conference. And we really appreciate the emphasis on Opportunity Zones. Um, as Dan mentioned, uh, we're based in Arlington, Virginia. We manage uh, you know, around that $10 billion number between uh, hedge, private equity, um, uh, structured product, and, and, and op zone money as well. Uh, we started a fund... Uh, actually in uh, August, uh, September of 2018. It was right before the first round of regs came out, which were in October. And then, of course, the final ones just came out a couple weeks ago uh, on April 17th. Um, so we're really excited about the space. We think it's not only a great opportunity to invest. Um, where we operate in Washington, D.C. is in the regulatory event-driven kind of space. So we look at regulatory change and we look at how that creates investment opportunity. But what's particularly noteworthy about the Opportunity Zone uh, regulations and law is that it really allows us to be um, also impact investors to some degree and allow our investors to do that. Um, and why do I say that? Because we think that now that the final regs have come out, uh, we think there's going to be um, a wave of investors. Uh, right now, the attention it's gotten a lot of attention. It's been building. Uh, but between the Milken Conference, now the SALT Conference, there's a lot of talk about uh, opportunity zones and what they really mean. And I think there's been a lot of uh, underselling of what the program's really about, with the exception probably of my partner, Manny Friedman. He hasn't undersold this at all. But, uh, but I do, we do think it's, it really is an opportunity to, uh, we have a, our fund's a real estate fund, so we're focused on the real estate uh, side. We think the jobs part, the, the business side, which just got clarified, is really going to take off, and it's going to have a positive feedback loop. It's really going to build on itself. Um, so what I'll mention just really quickly is that you know, we have two projects that we have already uh, kind of closed. We have another one we're going to announce next week. Um, and they're in basically, uh, and we have two after that that are coming down the pike. But what's, what's interesting is the op Opportunity Zone, you have to meet the regs by substantially improving, and I know uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but the substantial improvement test is a 31-month test. So you have to do ground-up development. And, and then you have to hold for 10 years. And so we, we're really looking at three basic areas. One is, is you, have to, you have to have a 10-year out, outlook on where things are going to go. So one is demographic-based, and that's uh, workforce housing. So multifamily housing, we think that's a great uh, uh, place to be. Um, and, and so we have a project uh, that we'll be announcing uh, in D.C. That's a, that's a multifamily housing project that has uh, affordable housing as a component of it. Uh, the second area is really logistics and, and warehousing, and our, and our project in South Carolina, which we did publicly announce, is really the epitome of why Opportunity Zones are exciting, uh, because it's in a rural county, it's in Jasper County, South Carolina. Uh, the average, or the median wage uh, income for a family is $22,000. Uh, so that, if you can come in, and we're going to do logistic and, and logistics and warehouse 
uh, project that's connected with the Savannah, uh, Georgia port, that's going to create jobs and that's the spirit of the regulation. And it's going to create not only construction jobs, it's going to create permanent jobs. It's going to affect that community in an incredibly positive way. It's going to increase the tax base. It's going to then improve the schools. It's going to uh, give people jobs so that they have the freedom to be active in the PTA and be members of their community. And then what we're doing um, is to really include a philanthropic wrapper around our project. So we're, we have a project in Oakland, project in South Carolina, now in DC. We're going to actively be involved in each of those projects because the way we look at it is we are tenure partners in those communities. And so we are going to embrace those communities not only through our investment dollars, which are attractive, but also to be uh, really, you know, uh, embrace the communities because we're now part of that community. So maybe I'll pause there and, uh, and, and, and you know, go to the next guest. No, no, that's, uh, that's great, Neil. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to uh, pass it to Alfonso uh, now. So um, maybe for, uh, for the audience, if you could just kind of connect the dots and, and talk a bit about HUD's role, the, the Opportunity Zone Council, which is obviously really uh, exciting, uh, and then a bit about uh, Secretary Carson's announcement today and, and what that means uh, for, uh, for OZs. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Anthony, and the rest of the SALT team for having us here. So the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council was cre created by an executive order that President Trump signed in December of 2018, and it essentially established a, an interagency council across 13 uh, federal agencies and then three federal state partnerships to come together and see how we can use existing authorities across programs and policies to really bolster opportunity zones and and make sure that we're providing resources into these economically distressed communities. The council is chaired by Secretary Carson of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the executive director was recently announced, Scott Turner, who has done a phenomenal job thus far uh, leading our council, traveling to varying cities, whether it be Cleveland or Birmingham, uh, Atlanta most recently, and really seeing what the, the, the pains and voids exist within the communities. So the council is actually structured into five subcommittees or work streams. So we have entrepreneurship, which is led by the Sm Small Business Administration, economic development by the Department of Commerce, safe neighborhoods led by the Department of Justice. We also have uh, education and workforce development led by the Departments of Education and Labor, respectively. And then lastly, measurement, which is led by the Council of Economic Advisors. And I think that last component is something that a lot of people have had a profound interest on recently and throughout the, the duration of the last year and a half since the Opportunity Zones were effectuated through the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. But Dan, you mentioned something that Secretary Carson announced today and something that we're really excited uh, to be discussing. And we recently, um, actually this morning, made it known to the public that we're going to be reducing application fees for our multifamily mortgage insurance programs, whether it be new construction or substantial rehabilitation or acquisition and refinance for properties and opportunity zones. Usually these application fees, which are better known as exam fees, are 30 basis points on the principal balance, but we're going to reduce it to 20 basis points for market rate units within opportunity zones and then 10 basis points for broadly affordable units within opportunity zones. And then also within that notice, we stipulated that our most senior underwriters for multi multifamily mortgage insurance uh, properties will be, uh, will be tasked to, to work on those, those applications. So those are the ways in which, not only on a sub-regulatory level, but we're going to be also announcing over the course of the next year uh, regulatory action items in addition to uh, legislative proposals as well. That's great. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alfonso. Uh, so, Reed, uh, on, to, uh, on to you. Um, uh, it would be great if you could, uh, could, could provide a, a, a bit of uh, um, a background on NES, of course, uh, your firm. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, given the services you are providing to QOFs, um, talk a bit about the importance of, of compliance and, and impact tracking, right, which of, uh, of course uh, your firm is, is active providing solutions for managers in the space. Yeah, thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks to the folks at SALT and SkyBridge for uh, putting such an important topic on the, on the agenda at this, at this conference. Um, NES is a company, they're a fintech company based out of uh, Silicon Valley. 
which was founded, we founded the company on this idea that there's certain types of specialty investment programs that get created from time to time that are really intended to do good, but for some reason or another, they fail to achieve that goal. Sometimes it's because there's too much regulatory complexity in the program, which is just a big burden on fund managers, drives up costs and complexity. Other times it's because there's not enough, frankly, and bad actors enter this space and fraud and abuse ensues. So one of the things I've really enjoyed about this conference is the conversations and focus that everybody seems to have, as Neil was describing, on doing good with, these, with this program and the, and the investments. So our approach is to build purpose-built technology for the unique characteristics of these different programs. So this is not a traditional private equity investment fund um, because there's also the component of it that has to do with tax compliance and all the complexity inherent in, in uh, that process, in addition to economic development, which is really the, the main thrust of this program. Uh, so our solution that we built, we felt fund managers would benefit from the ability to, of course, do all the traditional private equity fund accounting and reporting to investors and the like, but also to help them with the tax compliance uh, issues that arise, and also at the same time, track and monitor the impact and benefits that the investment is actually making in the local community. Because that'll help in a couple of ways. You know, we've done 27 funds already, so we've, we're starting to see trends in the market. And what we're seeing is that a good number of investors really care about the social impact that, that the, uh, the investment provides. Of course, the investment needs to be sound and solid first. Mm -hmm. But they do care, and so that helps in the, in the raising of capital. And the communities and the economic development corps are very interested in partnering with developers and funds to, uh, to accelerate and the, uh, the process of getting projects off the ground. And having this type of data is really important. Uh, so, so that's why we built this. And we're seeing, um, despite the fact that there's really no regulations enforcing this, we're seeing quality fund managers embrace this idea and, and include this as just part of their standard operating procedure. And, and to, uh, to be clear, Reed, when you say you're working with 27 or so managers, so you and I were discussing this the other day, um, yeah, NES is really a solution for you know, a, a developer, right, who's looking to develop a single asset and, and raise capital from multiple investors or you know, folks that are running commingled multi-asset products like, like Neil and myself, right? Yeah, exactly right. And I think that's really just been an evolution based on where regulations have evolved, right? Initially, the regulations were much more clear if you were trying to do a single asset deal. Uh, so that's what we saw the majority early on. Then we've seen an evolution, uh, evolution into multi-asset, multi-investors. Now we're seeing blind pool funds uh, becoming a thing. About 80% of the deals that we've done so far have been real estate centric, but um, a good portion, the other 20% was made up of some straight investments in, oper uh, in operating businesses, which until two weeks ago was probably a little risky given the lack of clarity on the regulations. Sure, sure. Uh, but another uh, portion of it was combining a, uh, a real estate project with an operating business component, which we thought was quite interesting. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, so I'm, one of the things, obviously, that, that NES provides for its clients, right, is this, this, this idea of some in, in tracking impact, right, which is very important, right? So this is really a question for all uh, panelists, right? But the, the, and this is something that, of course, uh, at Skybridge, we've spent a lot of time thinking about for our fund as well. So, so really the practical challenges to, to measuring and defining impact, right? And, and what does that look like? Um, and so there are obviously a bunch of different approaches, and this is obviously something that is very important. You know, all, all folks who have embraced Opportunity Zones and, and are excited about doing deals like we are that are consistent with the spirit of the program and are going to create jobs and going to create economic growth in these communities, you know, um, okay, that's part one, but now tracking that and measuring it is a challenge, right? So I, I'd love to hear the, the panel's opinion on on. Uh, how you're thinking about that. You know, mentioning earlier one of the work streams being measurement, again, we're very intent on developing robust analytics around uh, measuring the impact of opportunity zone investments. And we're really encouraged by the second tranche of regulations that the IRS released back in April and went to the Federal Register on the 1st of May, you know, indicating essentially that we do have an interest in being able to track job creation, new business starts, poverty reduction, 
And along with the second tranche of regulations, as you may know, there was a 30-day request, a re request for information, a solicitation of comment around uh, the additional things that should be reported both through the Form 8996 on the fund level, but even potentially on the taxpayer level as well. And so we're really eager to see um, what, what is submitted to the IRS through that solicitation of comments. But again, we really implore those who are in this space, even though they're at the time, at this time, might not be regulations that directly speak on um, additional reporting requirements, that that doesn't preclude investors and those who, again, who are operating in this space from identifying and really endorsing or embracing certain types of reporting frameworks like you would see with the U.S. Impacting Investing Alliance, a voluntary regulatory framework that they have, uh, have come up with after really working with a lot of important stakeholders across a wide breadth of, uh, of a community, so. What I would say, Dan, is I think, and, and again, I think it was yesterday, the day before, uh, Senate Bill 1344 was uh, put, put out by, um, you know, the, the uh, co-sponsors, you know, Tim Scott and Cory Booker, and I think particularly with this program, if you believe in this program, you have to embrace the reporting which you expect to come because it's going to answer the skeptics about whether the program will have an impact. And for those who embrace it, it's going to be the fodder for allowing it to be continued because it is a bipartisan program. It's often misconceived out there. You know, it came out of the Obama era. It was the brainchild of the Economic Innovation Group, our friends there, uh, as, as you know, Dan. And, and it's really, it, you have to give the Trump administration credit for, and, and Secretary Mnuchin and, and, and Secretary Carson taking steps to take it to the next level, and, and, and we really do appreciate that. But the reporting is critical, and what it's going to show is that the program has already taken off. What people don't realize is that, let's just look at the banks that have directly already set up OpZone funds. Not last week but months ago, Goldman Sachs, PNC, KeyBank, and then you have um, other players. Uh, announced yesterday was DHL. This is a foreign German corporation buying rural land in South Carolina, St. George's, South Carolina. It's, it's not a gentrification project, obviously. It's gonna create jobs for a logistics facility, and that's what you want. Why did they, why did they put it in an op zone? Why did they put it in their press release? I have to assume it's because they had capital gains and they figured that made sense. So the carrot of the program, if we can measure it and you can get some results, you'll see that it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that once that happens, this bipartisan nature can then be uh, extended and the scope can maybe be expanded. And another, uh, I'll leave it on this one, um, I mean, it was very interesting that Senator Kamala Harris and Senator Marco Rubio uh, had, had talked about, let's see if we can extend the program to disaster areas that have affected their states, you know, California and Florida respectively. And that really does show you that it is bipartisan. There, there are cheerleaders on both sides of the aisle that want this to work. And so bring all the reporting on. I think it'll only be a benefit for the program. Right. And Dan, to your point about the complexity and the heavy lifting associated with collecting all this data and reporting, it's really something that can be solved through technology. Um, and so the systems that are in place today by, that most fund managers use are oriented at a different application. There's really this notion of a specialty fund that's emerging that has different requirements and therefore different technologies can benefit it. I mean, this isn't hard compared to some of the other great technology breakthroughs I heard about at this event about extending life and those <laughs> kinds of things. You know, we can, They're very we can, important. They're, 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 they're very important. <laughs> extending legislation, there's nothing wrong with that. Right, no, nothing wrong with that, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. But, um, you know, we, we can clearly make this efficient. And what we found is it really doesn't cost any more to do all that stuff if you set it up properly at the beginning. That's great, great, great. Um, so, uh, so this next question, very specific one for Neil. Uh, I, I think um, for folks who, uh, who have followed EJF over the years, um, they will appreciate that um, uh, EJF uh, is, a, um, is a, a big investor in financial institutions and banks and is very, very well known um, uh, as a, a leader in that space. Uh, and one of the really, really interesting um, uh, things to think about in the, uh, when you think about opportunity zones is 
you know, this is, uh, there is a, 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 a lending opportunity here as well, right? And banks Absolutely. are going to be involved in a very big way. So, you know, if you can talk a bit about the, the interplay of, of bank lending and some of the opportunity that that's going to create, some, you know, CRA program and how that all ties together and, and you know, with OZs as well. Well, first you have to understand that um, construction and development is a small bank game, generally speaking. Almost half of all lending into construction and development projects in the United States are by banks that are 10 billion or under in assets. So it is a local activity. Um, and, and so they're the biggest beneficiaries of the program. And so if you believe that taking short-term capital gains or long-term capital gains, money that is idly sitting unproductively from a societal standpoint, and you're putting it into these zones, and you're doing ground-up development, who's going to benefit from that? Well, the banks are going to benefit, and certainly the small banks will have a disproportionate share of that. Uh, you mentioned CRA, which is the Community Reinvestment Act, and it's a piece of legislation in uh, uh, the Clinton era, and it, it, it appropriately requires banks that are active in communities to lend into those that are underserved by capital. If they want to expand branches, they want to merge. And so this is tailor-made for banks, small banks, to do CRA lending. And, and we think that's incredibly, incredibly uh, amplifying of the program. It takes the program um, to another level because of the interest you're going to have. And I'll give you an example. So Bank of America announced very recently and very consciously as part of the Opsone legislation, they were putting up a billion and a half dollars, and they're going to push it down into the 120 CDFIs, or Community Development Financial Institutions, that already exist throughout the country. Um, and they lend into local communities, tend to be in those areas that need, uh, you know, that need more access to capital. So you're already seeing the amplification of the program. We would argue that J.P. Morgan, which very you know, graciously said, look, we're putting $500 million into Detroit, Chicago, and Washington, D.C., that they're doing it in part for CRA uh, purposes, and, 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 and the Opportunity Zone really helps you get there. So we've, we've actually, at EJF, submitted a comment letter uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the government, the regs that are coming out on modernizing the CRA, and we said, look, why don't you amplify this program by making it a de facto qualification for CRA credit if you lend or invest in an opportunity zone? If you make that bright line rule, it certainty of regulation will amplify very the program. Powerful, for so, sure, anyway. for sure. And, and critically uh, important to all this, right, uh, it, perhaps it's obvious, but maybe it's not, right, is, is this means there's a lot of debt capital available for these projects, right? That means yes. more projects, more growth, right? And so, you know, I think Neil and I have experienced this when you meet with investors and they say, well, what is the, you know, when you think about, you know, any given development project, you know, there's a, there's a good chance that a portion of the, uh, the, the financing for that project will be debt financing. Um, and, you know, uh, investor, a, a common investor question was, well, you know, what will, you know, will banks be involved in this market? Do they want to be here? A and then, you know, think about what Neil just said about CRA. Yeah, they want to be here in a big way, right? So, uh, you know, this is, this is not something to be concerned about, the availability of debt financing. It, it will be there. And to Neil's point, if you made everything that is an OZ qualify, uh, that would be a really, really nice way. And then if I may add one little point. So, Think about the tax exempts and the foundations and the impact investors out there who do not benefit from the tax benefits of the statute, which allow you to, you know, delay paying capital gains and then get the, the benefit of, of reduction in capital gains when you do pay it in seven years and then the 10-year the uh, benefit of, of paying no capital gains of what you've invested in. If you're an impact investor, you're a tax-exempt investor, and think about these projects. They offer high equity uh, kind of projects. Instead of 20%, they're 35 40%. That's our experience. It's motivated equity, right? It's, you, these, this is tax-advantaged monies going in as equity. Um, and then the third thing is that CRA component. Banks often will lend at slightly below rates just to, for CRA purposes. So that mezzanine upon stabilization is really an interesting piece for players who aren't necessarily the first iteration or the first, first to target of the statute. So it's that second and third order impact we find is really fascinating and interesting, and we think it'll bring in even more, it'll be, again, a positive feedback loop. Oh, cool, cool. Um, so, Al Alfonso, this, this one's for you. So, so when you think about, and, and you know, from the perspective of a, 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 a manager in the space, um, like EJF or Skybridge, and we're seeking to deploy capital, right, and we've got big pipeline of deals, right, and we're trying to decide, you know, which deals to do, right, 
Um, they're obviously on the other side of that. There are you know, communities throughout the country that are, that are competing for that OZ dollar, right? They're competing for capital, right? And you got over 8,700 zones, right? So you know, from your perspective, and I know this is something that you thought quite a bit about, right? You know, what, what, can, you know, what, what can local communities do, right, to, to incentivize that OZ dollar to go there, right? And there are a bunch of different ways to do it. They can create their own incentives. They can minimize red tape. But, you know, I know this is something you thought quite a bit about. Well, thank you for that, Dan. And, you know, we've seen it on the state level, for example, in Maryland, the More Opportunities for Maryland, Marylanders Act, where they are proposing to provide tax credits for new businesses that locate or expand their operations within opportunity zones for, for new jobs that are created. Uh, we've also seen it on the city level, and I think one of the things that has been most intriguing in this space is the creation of investment prospectuses. So whether it be South Bend, Indiana, or Stockton, California, um, Accelerator for America is a nonprofit that's been working with a lot of cities to develop these investment prospectuses that are kind of a hybrid of a marketing strategy and an economic development plan to, to attract new private capital to really provide the resources for projects that they're looking for. I think that the most effective thing, especially in the real property space, that localities can do to really entice new capital is to look at the regulations that have traditionally or historically precluded the investment of capital into those communities. So that includes outdated building codes, off-street parking requirements, and in my opinion, most importantly, the protracted or delayed permitting and entitlement processes. And I think the second tranche of regulations did a little bit to, to quell those, type of, those types of concerns, especially with there being the ability to have multiple sequential or overlapping work and capital safe harbors for that 31-month period. Uh, but I, I don't think that's enough. I think the localities really need to not rely upon the regulations in that sense and see what are the things they can do to incentivize developers that are, are really worried about uh, their capital being, you know, risked in, in this instance. So, you know, we at HUD, again, the things that I, that I mentioned earlier, we're, we're trying to think of the ways to de-risk capital. And we have a big portfolio within Opportunity Zones already, more than $14.5 billion in unpaid principal balance across 2,400 multifamily properties. And the things that we're doing to propose um, the, and, and entice private capital we think is helpful, but it's really the onus and the onus and responsibility upon localities is there to really step up, especially in the regulatory space. And the and and to be clear, the the you know the the OZ Council is a, is a resource for those localities as well, right? I mean, if if they want some guidance in this area, a absolutely. And again, going back to where Scott Turner is going to be traveling throughout the country, and then also helping to coordinate across agencies, we love to hear feedback as to how we can work with states and localities to to think through those types of regulatory barriers that, again, have historically precluded investment. Fantastic. All right, so we have, we have about a, a, a minute left. If there's anybody that would like to make some closing remarks, um, I'm getting a... Well, I, I think I, I, could, I could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the philosophy in terms of the tracking and reporting. Um, you know, I, I really, personally, I really like the fact that this, this is regulation light. Um, and the regulations that are out there do provide us some guidance. So as a minimum, you know, that we know we're supposed to track substantial improvement on the investment in, as an, in an asset, as an example, and we're supposed to have 90% of the fund deployed within a certain period of time. Um, but there's not a lot beyond those kinds of levels of things that, that uh, need to be legislated or regulatory, from a re regulatory perspective imposed. So we've tried to take the approach, which I would encourage others to do, that sort of look back and say, well, if I was to get audited, picking on tax compliance for a moment, well, what are the pieces of evidence that I might need, like to have to help justify the exemptions in this case, right? And, and so those would obviously include, you know, tracking of the movement of the money at different times and those kinds of things, wire receipts and bank statements and the like. So um, approach it from that point of view, regardless of where the, uh, the regulations are. Fantastic. And, sure. and yeah, all I'd like course, to yeah. say at the end here is I'd really like to push against the narrative 
which we've heard a lot out there, and this from the skeptics, about that this is just accelerating gentrification and no more than that. You have to go back to the paradigm of taking money that's unproductive in Netflix stock or, or property that has low basis and has been sitting in the family for years. You're taking that out of, uh, out of unproductive uh, activity into productive activity and, and look at what DHL in rural South Carolina, look what we're doing in South Carolina, look at Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an island, 96% is in an op zone. Clearly not a gentrification uh, 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 strategy, right? So we think the legislation is a, you know, is a, is a bottoms up, decentralized program and Maybe there's a few areas that we're in that are already going to develop anyway, but don't, don't critique a whole program until the numbers are in and until the evaluations are done by the government, and then we'll see where the chips fly. But we're, we're very confident it's going to be a positive policy. A hundred percent. Look, I, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, more, the more time you spend in this space and you speak with other uh, managers, uh, investment managers, and, 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 and other stakeholders here, um, in these various communities and you look at the projects out there, um, this is an incredibly exciting program, right? And I think there's a lack of appreciation about how big this is gonna be. If you're deep in the trenches, you appreciate it. I know Neil and I appreciate it. I know Alfonso <laughs> and Reed appreciate it. Um, but uh, I, I think there are, there are a lot of folks, even with a really sophisticated audience, like the one we have in the SALT conference, where you know, there's a lot of unfamiliarity with the program. And obviously, we've had a lot of content on Opportunity Zones over the past couple of days. And it really reflects you know, uh, Skybridge's view that this is going to be a really, really big deal. right? And if you are uh, an investor, uh, you need to know about it, because it's going to dramatically impact the way that capital flows in this country over the course of the next decade. Um, so with that, uh, thank you uh, to, uh, to our panelists here. And, and of course, thank you very much uh, for being here and, and joining us uh, for the panel and also for SALT.